Today we begin a new adventure. A book I've read it never read, and it was made into a movie that I've never seen. And I know you're going to be surprised when you hear the title. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The Magical Car. It's written by Ian Fleming. Yes, that Ian Fleming of James Bond 007 fame. And if you find the illustrations, and the illustrations that will appear in this are by Joe Berger. And let's turn the page. Ian Fleming writes, These stories are affectionately dedicated to the memory of the original Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, built in 1920 by Count Zaborowski on his estate in Canterbury. She had a pre-1914 war chain drive 75 horsepower Mercedes chassis, in which was installed a six-cylinder Maybach aero engine the military type used by the Germans in their Zeppelins. Four vertical overhead valves per cylinder were operated by exposed push rods and rockers from a camshaft, camshaft on each side of the crankcase, and two Zenith carburetors were attached, one at each end of a long induction pipe. She had a gray steel body with an immense polished bonnet eight feet in length and weighed over five tons. In 1921, she won the 100 mile per hour short handicap at the Brooklands at 101 miles per hour. And in 1922, and again in the Brooklands, the lightning short handicap. But in that year, she was involved in an accident, and the Count never raced her again. By accident, this is a polite way of putting it. In fact, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang suddenly went mad with rage about something and the Count, at the wheel, got out of control and charged through the timing hut, very fast, backwards. <clears throat> Chapter 1. Crackpots Most motor cars are conglomerations, this is a long word for bundles, of steel and wire and rubber and plastic and electricity and oil, and petrol, and water, and the toffee papers you pushed down in the crack of the back seat last Sunday. Smoke comes out the back of them, and horn squawks come out the front. And they have white lights like big eyes in the front, and red lights behind. And that is about that. Just motor cars. Tin boxes on wheels for running about in. But some motor cars, mine, for instance, and perhaps yours, are different. If you get to like them and understand them, if you are kind to them and don't scratch their paint or bang their doors, if you fill them up and top them up and pump them up when they need it, and if you keep them clean and polished and out of the rain and snow as much as possible, you will find, you may find, that they become almost like persons, more than just ordinary persons magical persons. You don't believe me? All right, then. You just listen about this car I'm going to tell you about. I, can believe, I believe you can guess its name already. Her name, I should say. And then see if you don't agree with me. All motor cars aren't just conglomerations of machinery and fuel. Some are. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a family called Pot. There was a father who had been the royal na in the Royal Navy, Navy, Commander Correcticus Pot. You may think that Correcticus sounds like quite a funny name, but in fact the original Correcticus was a British chieftain who was a sort of a Robin Hood. In 48 AD, he led the English army against the Roman invaders. I expect since there have been plenty of other Correcticuses, but I don't know anything about them. Then there was the mother, Mimsy Pot, and a pair of eight-year-old twins, Jeremy, who was a black-haired boy, and Jemima, who was a golden-haired girl. And they lived in the big wood beside a big lake with an island in the middle. On the other side of the lake, M20, the big motorway, the big motorway. once again, I've not pre-read these, and I'm not editing them. 
So you get the, cho the joy of all of my word numbers. The big motorway on the Dover Road swept away towards the sea. So they had the best of both worlds. Lovely woods for catching beetles and finding birds' eggs, with a lake for newts and tadpoles, and a fine big road close by so that they could go off and see the world if they wanted to. Well, almost, that is. But the truth of the matter was that they hadn't got enough money between them to buy a car. All the money that they had went to necessities, food and heat and light and clothes and all those boring things that one doesn't really notice but that families have to have. There was only a little left over for birthday and Easter and Christmas presents and the occasional surprise outings, you know, the things that really matter. But the Potts were a happy family who all enjoyed their lives and since they weren't in the least sorry for themselves, or sorry they hadn't got a motor car to go whirling about in, we needn't worry about them either. Now, <clears throat> Commander Correcticus Pot was an explorer and an inventor. And that may have been the reason the Pot family was not very rich. Exploring places and inventing things can be very exciting indeed. But it is only very seldom that in your explorations, you discover a really rare butterfly or animal or insect or mineral or plant that people will pay money to see. And practically never that you discover real treasure, like in books, gold bars and diamonds and jewels in an old oaken chest. And as for inventions, much the same troubles apply. People all over the world, in America, Russia, China, Japan, let alone England, Scotland, and Wales, and Ireland, are inventing or in trying to invent things all the time. Every kind of thing, from rockets that fly to the moon, to ways of making India rubber balls bounce higher. Everything, everything, everything is being invented or improved all the time by somebody, somewhere. Whether by teams of scientists in huge factories and laboratories, or by lonely men sitting and just thinking in tiny workshop, workshops without many tools. <clears throat> Just such a solitary inventor was Commander Caractacus Pot. And I am ashamed to say that because he was always dreaming of impossible inventions and adventures and explorations in the remotest parts of Earth, he was generally known in the neighborhood as Commander Crackpot. You may think that's rude, and so it is. But Commander Pot was a humorous man, and he knew his shortcomings very well. So when he heard that that was his nickname in the neighborhood, he wasn't cross at all. He just roared with laughter and said, I'll show them, and disappeared into his workshop and didn't come out for a whole day and night. During that time, smoke came out of the workshop chimney, and there were lots of delicious smells. And when the children put their ears to the locked door, they could hear mysterious bubblings and cooking poppings, if you know what I mean, but nothing else. When Commander Pot came out, he was so hungry that the first of all he ate four fried eggs and bacon and drank a huge pot of coffee, and he asked Mimsy to call Jeremy and Jemima, who were getting in an awful mess digging out of a water rat's hole at the bank of the lake. They never caught the water rat. He dug down faster than they did. The twins came and stood side by side, looking at their father, what, wondering what invention he had this time. Commander Pot's inventions were sometimes dull things, like collapsible coat hangers, and sometimes useless things, like edible gramophone records, and sometimes clever things that just, only just, wouldn't work, like cubicle potatoes, easy to slice and pack and peel, but expensive to grow each in its own little iron box, and so on. Commander Pot, looking very mysterious, dug in his pockets and produced a handful of what looked like round colored sugar sweets, each a bit bigger than a marble wrapped in paper. And still looking mysterious, he chose a red one for Jeremy and a green one for Jemima and handed them over. Well, 
Sweets are always sweets, thought the children, even though they didn't look very exciting. So they unwrapped them, and they were just about to pop them in their mouths when Commander Pop cried, Wait! Look at them! Look at them first! Very carefully! The children looked at the sweets, and Commander Pot said, What do you see? What's different about them? And Jem Jeremy and Jemima said, with one voice, or almost, They've got two small holes drilled through the middle of them. Commander Pot nodded solemnly. Now suck them. So Jem Jeremy and Jemima popped the sweets into their mouths and sucked busily away, looking at each other with raised eyebrows. As much to say, what do you notice? What do you taste? Mine tastes of strawberry. Mine tastes of peppermint. And both pairs of eyes seem to say, they're just sweets. Round boiled sweets. And our tongues can feel the holes in them. Otherwise, they're just like any other sweets. But Commander Pot could easily see what they were thinking suddenly held up his hands. Now stop sucking, both of you. Twiddle the sweets around with your tongues until they're held between your teeth, with the twin holes pointing outwards. Then open your lips and blow. Well, of course, the children laughed so much, watching each other's faces as they nearly swallowed the sweets, but finally, by turning their backs on each other, they managed to compose themselves and fix the, teeth, the sweets between their teeth. And then they blew. And do you know what? A wonderful, shrill whistle came out, almost like a toy steam engine. The children were so excited that they went on whistling until Commander Pot sternly told them to stop. He held up his hand. Now go on sucking until I tell you to whistle again. And he took out his watch and carefully observed the minute hand. Now! This time, Jeremy and Jemima didn't laugh so much. They managed to get their sweets, which of course were much smaller than before, between their teeth, and they blew like Billy Ho. This time, because they're sucking it hollowed out the holes a bit still more, the whistle was a deep one, like one of the new diesel trains going into a tunnel. And they found that they could play all sorts of tricks, like changing the tone by blocking up one hole with their tongues and half closing their lips so as to make a buzzing whistle and lots of other variations. But then, what with their sucking and their blowing, and the bit between the two holes collapsed, and the sweets made one last deep hoot, and then crunched, as all sweets do in the end, into little bits. Jeremy and Jemima both jumped up and down with excitement at Commander Pot's invention, and begged for more. Then Commander Pot gave them each a little bag full of the sweets and told them to go out into the garden and practice every whistling tune they could think up. As after lunch, he was going to take them to Scrumptious Limited, the big sweet people at their local town, to give a demonstration to Lord Scrumptious, who owned the factory. And they ran out into the garden, and Commander Pot called after them, they're called crackpots. Crackpots whistling sweets. And you know what, my little chickabitties? They're going to buy us a motor car. But the children were already dancing away into the woods, making every kind of whistle you can think of, at the same time sucking like mad with their delicious treats. There was really something seemingly special about Commander Pot's invention. Just a little touch of genius. Well, anyway, I can tell you this. Lord Scrumptious thought so. After he heard Jeremy and Jemima whistling in his office, he sent them out into the factory, and they danced around among the workers, sucking and whistling and handing out sweets from their packets, so that very soon they had all the factory workers in the factory sucking and whistling, and everyone laughed so much that all the Scrumptious sweet machines came to a stop. Lord Scrumptious had to call Jeremy and Jemima away before they brought the whole production of scrumptious sweets and chocolates to a grinding halt. So, Jeremy and Jemima went back into Lord Scrumptious' grand office, and there was their father, being paid one thousand pounds by the scrumptious company treasurer, and signing a paper which said he would get an additional sixpence for every thousand crackpot whistling sweets 
sold by Scrumptious Limited. Well, Jeremy and Jemima didn't think that sounded like very much. But when I let you in on a secret, I tell you that Scrumptious Limited sells five million every year of just one of their sweets called Chaka Hoop, you can perhaps work out for yourself that maybe, just maybe, Commander Caractacus Pot wasn't making such a bad bargain after all. So then everyone shook hands, and Lord Scrumptious gave Jeremy and Jemima each a big free box of samples of all the sweets he made. The three of them hurried off back to Mimsy to tell her the good news, and straight away the whole family hired a taxi and went to the bank to deposit the check for a thousand pounds. And then, and then, they all went off together to buy a car.